IBUS and try to make it work. And, and actually, if you use the latest um, GNOME 3 release and play around with the input method, it kind of looks nice. I, I mean, it really looks nice. So there are, there are some problems. Of course, there are people complaining about it because it's not, not the fastest input method for Chinese and all that. But, you know, actually, it's better than what they had before. Um, what are input methods now? It's a bit more than just this traditional stuff. And the problem that I have to talk here is because it's actually affecting you already. If you have an iPhone or if you have an Android, <coughs> um, if you have the virtual keyboard, that's input method. And not just a virtual keyboard. If you think about um, speech recognition, then that's, of course, also input methods. And this is a common problem if you, if you deal with input method developers. They want a unified architecture. Um, they really don't have that. They have, the, they have um, X input methods, which is which was first described in 1994. And you can go read it. It's a nice, long spec. And you have to care about a lot of details. And yeah, I'm not going to go into that, really. So you have these input method developers that want to have a unified um, architecture. The logical choice would be XIM. XIM is a bit too complex. On the other side, you have um, these, these, uh, these people who, who write these um, UI toolkits. And they don't want to bother actually too much with, with input methods because uh, yeah, XIM is complex. Let's have our own API. Let's make it a bit simpler. And then of course these APIs are not the same across toolkits. And then some toolkits have keyboards in mind, like Qt5. And GTK says, ah, not important. So you can use a complex API, then you have a unified solution with X. Or you can use a simplified API, and then you have to do it five times, six times. I don't know how often or how many toolkits you want to support. Um, this is a problem we specifically faced um, during Nokia times, that there's no protocol evolution in XIM. Um, we had some proposals how to extend the protocol, and it was very simple stuff. It was, uh, we need a new window type so that you can recognize um, the virtual keyboard uh, X window as a special window. You need that because a uh, virtual keyboard has some special transient properties. It needs to stay on top of the application. And when the application crashes, you want the keyboard to go away. When you, when you, change, when you switch between applications, then you, you probably want to hide it and all that stuff. Um, so you need to recognize the input panel, and that's important for the window manager, right? So that was rejected. And the other thing that we, um, that we had is to, to describe the area, how much it's consumed by this input panel. Because it's, it's, um, as an overlay, it's space that the other application can't really use. And you should say, well, don't put any important content underneath this area, because it's not, not a normal window where you could just um, switch the stacking order. This one's going to be always on top. So don't put anything important in this critical area. But both were rejected and, yeah. Um, so XIM didn't really uh, evolve in the last years. Doesn't adapt to modern or advanced use cases. So even though it was a unified solution, it's not longer something I would recommend. Oh, that looks nice. Um, so one display server, many platforms. This is uh, a simplification of the Linux traffic stack. And I mean simplified because <laughs> it simplifies <laughs> the button actually uh, quite a bit. It's because I want to show, I want to show how, how the, the higher up you go, the more choice you get. And if you're an input message developer, um, yeah. XIM, that's on this level. Um, these toolkit provided APIs for input methods, they are up there. And then you see already um, there are shell extensions and applications. What I mean is, you look at these application to, uh, at these UI toolkits, and you have to do the application support, and then you still have to integrate your input method with window managers or shells. 
to make it a pleasant experience. And all the time while you do that, you, you kind of want to pull out your hair and you think, why is XIM so horrible? Because it's actually at the right level of the stack, you would have to do only one thing right, and then everyone else could just use that. You don't, wouldn't have to do all the degradation. Now, being a consultant, actually this is great, why I'm complaining. I'm going to set the same solution every time. Every year I'm going to set the same solution to a new customer, and I've already solved this problem, and I can do it again, and again, and again, and again. I shouldn't complain. It's get, it gets boring. So, first, I wasn't really convinced about Valent, because um, all I said about Valent was it's going to render fast and everything, and I was like, yeah, yeah, like, as if performance matters on my desktop, or come on, these phones are fast enough, and all that. So I wasn't really convinced that, um, that, that um, Valent is any better than, um, than X. Then I looked at um, what Valent actually is, um, and that you can use it for defining protocols, and I like the idea that you have these XML protocols, and then generate the, the, the C interfaces from that, and you also have the IPC right there automatically without even having to thinking about the IPC. And I thought, well, you know what, if you have this, these XML files, it's actually pretty easy to come up with a new protocol and uh, to try it out. And it really is simple. It really is simple. And that's when, um, yeah, I came a bit late to the party. When I, when I discovered the possibilities in Wayland, it was already clear what we would have in Wayland 1.0. And my ideas um, were coming too late. But, but when we met here, Last year, first time, you know how it goes. We had some beers late night, and we had the right people in the room. And then the question came up, if you had the possibility to do input methods right from scratch, what would you do? Well, let me have a beer on that. And then we started, and it was not really a crazy talk there. That we had, we could do this and that, and wouldn't it be good? And it was coming bigger and bigger and bigger, this idea. And in the end, we realized maybe we should try it out and do it. And then, half a year ago or so, we had a prototype. It was in, in July or, or August. A very, very simple example showing it can be done. I mean, really trivial example. Probably one week of work, if even that. And from there on, we have been trying to do um, a real implementation. So input methods are not going to are not in Valent 1.0 because originally Valent was not designed to have input methods in that sense. But if you look at X, and if people talk about Valent as a successor to X, like X12 maybe, then it only works if you're fine with a huge API break and with major regressions across the board, because a lot of features just go away. And slowly, people realize that input methods is something, or is a regression that you can't have. It's actually important enough, you're going to get, have an, a lot of complaints, you can't ignore it. So, what, what, what we did, we, um, um, we had some ideas what we wanted to simplify. <coughs> and basically we identified three parties. Um, what you see on the right um, are input method developers and the API we want to offer for them. And we make the API simple enough for these uh, input method developers because they complain all the time. <laughs> and we want them to adopt our API, so it means we can't make it complex. If you make it complex, then they're going to say, yeah, but XAM is uh, better anyways, it's better supported. Come on, guys. Um, yeah, so we have to make it simple for them to convince them to, 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 to use the offered uh, valent API to write their input methods. Um, and then in the center, you have those guys who write window managers and compositors in their spare time. These guys are up for a challenge. I mean, you, you, can, you can throw everything at them and it doesn't really bother. For them, it's not important that, that it doesn't have to be simple. You can actually put all the complexity of your protocol design there for the, compos for the compositor guys. Let them give us the complexity, right? And they are the experienced guys. They know what they do. 
And then let's be honest, there are not going to be that many Wayland compositors out there. This thing called reference compositor Western um, is becoming clear that it's more than just a reference implementation. It's probably going to be the next standard. Um, there's so much complexity that it already deals with. If you look at it, that's nothing you want to do again. So even though it was originally designed like, yeah, this is just an example, compositor, how you could do it, you should, you're supposed to write your own. I bet that most people will just use Western and adapt it uh, for their needs. That's another reason why I think we can put the complexity of the input method protocol um, in this reference implementation. Then, on, on, the, on, the, on the leftmost side, we have the UI toolkits. Again, for the UI toolkits, you have to make it simple, but not as simple as maybe for the input method guys, because they have realized over, over the years that, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit more complex. Actually, the important part here is that you get to talk, uh, or that you get these people of these different UI toolkits to talk to each other, to have the same semantical implementation of that. Because what's important for us is not just the API, but how you implement that. <coughs> um, we expect well-behaving clients. We, 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 if you didn't expect well-behaving clients, we would have a very, very complex protocol. Um, so if our goal is to simplify the protocol, that's one of the trade-offs we have to do. Well behaved clients, which means, which means we have to write a lot of documentation, which we currently didn't do yet. Um, all we did is provide some examples. So if you go to the Western code base, you see these um, examples in the client um, directory, in the client directory. And there's a simple keyboard, a simple editor, and a simple um, input method that would simulate uh, this um, Chinese input. Um, If you, if you want to see the, the API that input method developers want to use, you go to protocol and you have this input method XML file. You have, these, um, you have several interfaces, but they're not really complex. The first one, input method context, is the one that represents the application data, actually just a text entry, like where's my cursor position, what is the text, um, what is um, the surrounding text maybe. This is a kind of um, text editor state that is represented in the input method context. And you have the input method that's just responsible for handling creation and destruction of this context. Um, and then input panel and input panel surface um, are just for the representation of the keyboard and for creating these surfaces. Um, you probably know already that there is a distinct uh, separation in, 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 in Wayland protocols between requests and events. So requests, uh, um, always one direction, uh, you, can, you can send data, it's like writing to the compositor process if you want. And the other thing is um, events, that you read something from that that you, that you got, and it's all asynchronous of course. Um, you will realize that what is, an, what is an request here becomes an event on that side, and what is a request on that side becomes an event on this side, but you just have to trust me, it's, it's down there. Um, that's logical, because these interfaces are complementary. UI toolkits implement that side, um, and they have to go in the one direction. Input method developers implement that side, and they have to go in that direction. And here, you have to implement the logic to make that work. So, our design is not, it's not the most efficient one here in terms of raw speed. Because if that's your application, one process, that's your um, compositor, second process, and that's your input method, the third process. What, what happens if you send this message over the IPC? Is you first send it from here to the compositor, and then this one um, sends it again as an event uh, to, 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 the, to the application. What you could do is, once you know which application wants to talk to which input method, you could probably just do a direct connection between the two, right? If that ever becomes important. We think that in input methods, um, speed is important, yes, but only up to a certain point. Once you make sure that it's below 30 or 20 milliseconds, one round trip, you're fine. It only gets noticeable if it's 50 or 100 milliseconds. But if you check the valent IPC, um, we are pretty far away from that. It's 
pretty safe so far. So you don't need any extra optimizations. So this slide is actually the same what you saw before on the other one with let's text, but it discusses these, um, these processes a bit more. Um, and, and here, actually, what I think one of the nicer parts We've decoupled input methods from the application toolkits, from the UI toolkits. So you, you can write your input method with whatever toolkit you want, or with no toolkit at all. Um, you just use the Western provider, you just use the, the Valent protocol and um, what's provided for you. And then the applications can be whatever they want, and they can, can talk to your input method because well, there's an IPC in between, a proper separation. And so the toolkit question is uh, no longer important. Um, what is nice is that at the same time this input method is a regular um, valent client, which means, which, which means it can use surfaces and all that as if it was an application client. That actually, actually simplifies a lot. Um, the only thing we do is whatever the input method does, whatever the input method renders, it gets this a special input panel surface <coughs> flag so that we can recognize it as a compositor. This is the same flexibility that you would get with XIM, I have to be honest. You already have this flexibility with XIM. There's nothing new. And I'm not saying that XIM, from an architecture point of view, is bad. It's just old and didn't evolve, and it's complex. So, this is the screenshots. I'm not going to do any live demos. I mean, it's too late for me, and I, I wasn't the one writing the code anyway, so I'm just a talker. So, what you see here is an EFL application. You see that because it uh, has this fancy title bar. And you have this simple Western keyboard. And there's actually uh, no support for this input method in, in, in the... In, 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 an EFL, and this keyboard doesn't know about EFL either. All there is, is that this keyboard is using the Spalen protocol, and we've done some simple integration for input methods, for valent input methods in EFL. And if you look at the code itself, you will see that it's not that much work, but you get all this kind of flexibility. You can combine and then choose freely whatever you want. This is, um, this is actually um, the, the keyboard that we used on the on nine and in a modified, a, mo a very heavily modified way. But again, this keyboard doesn't know about EFL, but you can just use it. You just tell Western use this uh, Mali keyboard, and it works. It works the same way as the other one because the semantics are are defined in the application integration and in the compositor. There's no guessing anymore. It's it's a very defined protocol. You can't really. Yeah, too much wrong. Um, this is actually something very nice, I have to say, because subsurfaces, I think it came up on the meeting this in, in December last year. And it's not a feature that is in uh, Wayland 1.0, but it's going to be in the next version if you've been to, to, to Rob Bradford's talk this morning um, in 1.1. And you can compare subsurfaces with the transient hint in, in X11. But in X11, the transient hint is really just one ID, a window ID, that you set as a property on, on some other window. So you can read it or you can ignore it. Most window managers only use it for, for dialogues, but for, nothing, for not much else. <coughs> the subsurfaces, you have a similar idea. You can connect an um, amount of windows, if you want, surfaces, and treat it as a group. But at the same time, there are strict semantics in, in Valent, how sub subservices behave. You move them together as one group, because they are positioned uh, relatively to each other, at least the subsurface, relative to the parent surface, and you rotate them together. You hide them together, you show them together. There's not, nothing you have in, in X that depends on your window manager, and there are so many different window managers, they all treat this transient hint differently. So, if I wanted to use this transient hint in my application, in my input method, I can't do any fancy stuff because I know 
I would then have to fix all these window managers to do the same thing that I expect them to do. Now with subsurfaces, it's different. The semantics are given. I know how they behave. And actually, I actually can use it now because I, I can predict how it's going to behave. And that's important. So what I'm saying is by taking away flexibility and having strict semantics, um, you actually can improve things. It's not always bad to take away flexibility. Sometimes it's an improvement. So, why is it important for input methods? It's because an input method, a keyboard, um, might consist of different um, input panels. One would be uh, a split keyboard, I'm not showing that here, but the other um, use case for subsurfaces is these key magnifiers, for instance. Um, in X, these would have been se separate top-level windows. You can, you can do that, it's easy. Um, so subsurfaces and, 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 and VLAN bring you both. They, they give you the same or similar semantics as a transient hint, or you can use it for similar use cases. At the same time, you can, you can now have these um, top-level windows, but you can yeah, have a bunch of them and treat them as one group. That's actually quite nice. So, can you see that? Yeah. So that's one of the other design uh, issues we faced and, and when we used um, X and had our castle protocol with some X properties and um, then we realized we need sync calls in that. And there's one problem if you have a protocol and you design it with sync calls in between. Let's say we send something here and uh, we, we expect an answer from the other process up there from the application and we only get it at this point because there's an IPC between, it's not instant, then all this time is actually lost. It doesn't, doesn't matter whether the application, whether the input method blocks during that time. All that matters is that during this time, you can't do anything else related to this protocol. You have to wait for the answer first. Um, that's, of course, an easy fix for that, and it fits very well with the, um, with the ideas of Valent. And that is that you introduce um, a sequ sequence number. So now, when at certain points, the application has to increase um, a sequence number. And that's when you activate the text, edit, and when you reset it. <coughs> and then this sequence number is part of all your requests. And the input method receives that and sends its own requests with this sequence number. And what happens is, if at this point, if you do a reset and increase the sequence number, and we, we, we send it to commit string with the old sequence number, we know that the application can simply ignore it. At some point, we get the reset from the input mass, uh, from, from the application. We know that we have to increase our sequence number, but we also know that we send a, sequ uh, a commit string with an old sequence number, so we just have to send it again. So this is logic you have to implement in the input method. But, uh, but the nice thing about it is there's no uh, further synchronization required. You get to reset, and you know you have to send it again, some data. That's it. Um, and that fits actually the protocol design of, of Valent very nicely. So if you're interested in more details and code, some more videos, just go to the blog of my colleague, Yanani. He actually did the work, um, not me. And um, yeah, you will find everything there. You will even find some Nokia history there where he explains the problems. But that's it's a, a it's a lot of stuff to read. So yeah. Any questions? Is somebody